Hi friends, have a look at my screen and you will see a stock called Gujarat Themis Bison Limited GTBL. I created a video on my channel about this stock recently and you will see that in the last five years stock has given close to 2000% returns and some of you commented on that video saying that Rahul this stock price is already 800 rupees. Can you not talk about the stocks that are trading at a level let us say 50 rupees somewhere here when this stock was not a multi bagger stock. So in this video I'm going to talk about three key stocks that have given very good returns in the recent past and I will talk about the future prospects of those multi bagger stocks and more importantly the risk associated with the stocks. This is going to be exclusive content so please stay tuned you won't find this content anywhere on YouTube so if you like it please press the like button with that let's get this video started the first stock that I want to talk about is Indian Railway Finance Corporation Limited which is IRFC and what you see on my screen is that in the last one month the stock has given close to 37% returns and in the last one year the stock has given close to 126% returns so it has already doubled the money but the question is is this stock really quality stock and what are the risks associated with that can this stock go to 500 rupees level is the question I will try to answer in this video. I'll present to you totally unbiased facts and you make a decision. So with that let me now present to you the business model of this company and before I do that let me talk about when was IFRSC created. So let me first talk about IRFC's journey. So this company is not a recent company that has come into limelight all of a sudden. The company was created back in 1986. This company was created mainly to fund the Indian Railways because Indian Railways heavily relies on central government's funding that the railways get but time to time they may need additional funding and for this very same reason IRFC was created. So what is their business model? Let me quickly walk you through what you see on my screen is they are a NBFC non-banking financial corporation. Basically they raise funds, they raise debt and then they fund the Indian railways. Let me walk you through very quickly. So basically they issue things such as bonds, short term loans, long term loans, external commercial borrowing and things like that. So basically they raise funds and they give these funds to Indian railways for their development because they always need funds depending on how much money the central government has given them in a particular year. So if you see my screen you will see that primarily IRFC gives funds to Indian railways for two purposes. Number one is they help them acquire rolling stocks. What are rolling stocks? Rolling stocks are the train engine for example, train coaches and things like that. Also secondly what they do is they help them set up the railway infrastructure. So for example a simple example could be that they are funding them to set up a railway station that will have platform that will have train tracks. So this is called the project work and if you see their AUM you will clearly see that roughly 13% of their assets have been given to the project related assets. 38% of their AUM right now is for the rolling stocks and 47% of this they have given for infrastructure related assets. So primarily their business model is to raise the funds and give it to Indian railways to allow them to do development. But what what makes their business model really really risk free is what we need to talk about. So what you see on my screen is that from a rating perspective Chrysal, Ikra, Care have given them stable long term rating as well as from an international rating perspective if you see here they are rated stable which is at par with the Indian sovereign rating. So they hold a strong credit rating in the market and what that allows is that they can raise these funds at a slightly lower rate than other NBFC giving them a lot of leverage. The second beauty of their business model is that they charge a fixed spread on the money that they lend to Indian Railways. So for example here you see my screen rolling stocks for example they charge 0.4% on top of their funds that they have received from the market. They charge that to Indian Railway. Secondly on the project assets they charge fixed percentage which is 0.35%. That makes their business model model really really solid model because essentially what they're trying to do is they are trying to pass on all the risks to the Indian railway. For example here last year the interest rates were really really huge but it doesn't matter to this company because all they are doing is they are borrowing the money from the market giving it to the Indian railways passing on all the risk to them in terms of even the currency rate risk interest rate risk. So passing all of that risk back to the Indian railway and in between they are just taking a margin which is 0.4% which is again fixed from a rolling stock perspective and 0.35% from a project assets perspective. So this makes their business really really risk free that no matter what the currency rate situation is going, what is happening with the interest rates in the market, they are going to get this margin which is 0.40% as well as 0.35%. And when somebody recently asked them this question in their earnings calls that what is the chances of this 
this 0.40 percent and 0.35 percent margin going down because of any reason what their managing director said is that look this rate has been fixed for last four years they don't see it coming down so from a margins perspective the business seems to be stable and their margins are going to be very very stable which makes this nbfc really really a solid business model right now having understood their business model now let me present you the future prospect of this company and also the risk associated with the company's stock so first thing that i want to talk about is have a look at my screen i want to talk about indian railways or government of india's initiative of creating production link incentives in the cases of railways and what they plan to do is they want to replace 28 types of passenger coaches by LHB and Vande Bharat. So primarily they are going to replace a lot of coaches that Indian railways use today by only two types which is LHB which is a German design and also Vande Bharat. So what it does is basically it is going to present a lot of opportunity for funding these coaches and if I look at some of the projections by 2047 there is a plan to get 4500 Vande Bharat trains in India and if I look at the cost of one Vande Bharat train it comes out to be close to 120 crore rupees and right now if I present to you right now I think there are only 25 if I look at the routes here only 25 Vande Bharat trains it is going to be close to 4500 Vande Bharat trains assuming 120 crore per train let us do a simple math it comes out to be 540,000 crore rupees of investment over the next 15 to 20 years is what we could expect and if if I show you their current AUM you will say it is 466,000 crores it is going to double if we take this 540,000 crore rupees of Vande Bharat investment. The second big opportunity in front of this company is that company is looking at forward integration as well as backward integration meaning that right now the biggest risk the company faces is that they are only funding Indian railways so there is a concentration risk here the company is embarking upon going for diversification so for example they are now getting into leasing of rolling stocks other than Ministry of Railway. So they have recently signed an agreement with NTPC which is beyond the Ministry of Railways. So recently what they have done is they have in principally agreed to fund a railway line which is in Haryana from Palwal to Sonipat. So it's a joint venture between state government and the central government and what they are doing is they are funding such projects as well. So they are moving away just from the Indian Railways perspective to diversify their business. Now this is going to take a lot of time because if you read the comments by Shali Verma, their MD what clearly she is indicating here is that these projects will need to have right framework they will have to set up the right landing framework because till date they have only been funding the Indian railways but if they want to get into other territories what they need to do is have the right processes the frameworks they have to onboard certain agencies so it is going to take time for them to be able to bring this diversification onto the table but from a future perspective this looks like a good strategic move is what I would say also if we consider 10 years 15 years down the line from here there is a possibility that the company might venture into the private sector as well and this is the comment that Shali Verma again has talked about that once they go beyond the Ministry of Railways and after the state joint ventures and the government sector they might foray into the private sector as well who knows and the third thing that I want to talk about from a future prospect perspective is that NRP vision 2030 in which Indian government wants to increase the railway freight to 45% so that is quite aggressive and it would need lot of carriages etc and this is where IRFC can really help Indian railways to get to this target so all in all from a future perspective the prospects look really positive but the billion dollar question is that should we invest our money into this stock right now or not now you will say that Rahul you have been talking about good good things about this company shall we go and invest in this company right now well what I need to also tell you is that very recently there was a news that IRFC is coming up with offer for sale in terms of diluting its stake by 11% because if I show you their current shareholding pattern you will see that right now government of India holds 86% stakes and legally they have to come less than 75% so they plan to sell the remaining 11% and therefore the share is going to see short term volatility. No doubt the future prospect of IRFC looks really really good but what we need to do is make sure the timing of buying the stock is right so that you do not buy the share at a high price and end up losing money in the short term because of the 
the very same reason right now i am not considering to invest in this company i will consider this stock in the near future and the day i take any positions in this stock i will announce on my youtube member community please consider subscribing to my youtube member community because that is where i talk about in depth analysis on stocks as well as my personal investments so that you can get benefited so far if you are liking this video hit the like button so that more and more people can understand the nuances of these businesses and stocks as well the second stock that i want to talk about is indian energy exchange limited iex many of you dropped comments asking me to analyze iex i'm not going to do deep dive analysis here but i will give you the gist of this stock if you have a look at my screen you will see back in january 20 the stock was trading at roughly 60 rupees and by the time december 2021 came the stock was at all time high at 295 levels and from that time onwards the stock has continuously falling and right now trading at close to 126 rupees level so what is the reason behind this sharp decline in the last 2 years is what i want to quickly explain to you because that will also set the scene for the next few years so that you understand what are the risks and the future prospect of this company and more importantly many people right now blindly think that this is a buying opportunity because the stock has fallen from 300 levels to close to 125 rupees level but before Before you take any positions in this sunking ship, you need to understand the reasons behind it. So, one of the key reasons for this sharp decline is the Ministry of Power's decision. to explore the option of market coupling in the indian energy context what does it actually mean i will simplify it in the next 1 minute so in india right now there are three energy exchanges energy exchange is a place where the energy can be traded very much similar to when we trade stocks we go to bse and nse and that's where the stock trading happens buyers and sellers come together and the exchange decides the pricing depending on the demand and supply very much similar to the same concept indian energy exchange is one of the exchange among three other exchanges where the buyers and sellers of the energy come together and iex actually decides the price of the energy based on the demand and the supply but as you see on my screen more than 90% of the buyers and sellers solely depend on iex currently iex is the most trusted platform when it comes to the electricity spot price but what this market coupling is going to do is there is going to be an intermediary which is called market coupler and this market coupler will collect all the buy orders and the sell orders and they will do the matching of the orders and that will decide the pricing of the electricity what does that simply mean is that iex will no longer be able to determine the prices of the ener energy on the exchange and therefore is going to lose market share as well as its authority to decide the prices of electricity because of this looming risk investors are dumping this stock and the prices have been consistently falling in the market now just to put this in some context i also looked at the earnings presentations and you will see on my screen sn goel who is the managing director of the company clearly said that right now regulator which is crc is exploring the options of doing market coupling but from his point of view market coupling in indian context does not make sense he quoted an example of european market which is where you see 27 different countries and there the market coupling made more sense because then 27 countries can have one uniformed pricing if they have a market coupler in between so that the energy prices can be regulated while in cases of uk he said there are two exchanges right now and there is no need of a market coupler in such an environment because you do not have dispersed countries diverse geographic graphics and so on and sn goel thinks that indian market is more similar to uk market rather than european market where you have a lot of countries so he thinks that regulator will carefully consider this before implementing market coupling so market coupling is not a decision that is done and dusted the regulator is still exploring the options about it therefore the share prices will depend on that also if i read another comment by sn goel what he also questions is that if the market coupling comes in between then the role of energy exchange dilutes because right Right now, one of the main point of exchange is to do. price discovery and if they are not doing price discovery what is the role of exchange that is a legitimate question that sn goel really raises here but having said that the real risk of market coupling remains a risk for people like you and me and i think we need to consider this before taking any positions in this stock does it mean that it is all gloom and doom for this company well may not be because also have a look at some of the positives of this stock so if i talk about the latest regulation crc has issued something called as indian grid code regulation 2023 and it is going to be 
applicable from 1st of October 2023. Simply meaning that generators would be able to buy energy from the exchange now in cases of any shutdown or force outage. That means the demand for electricity is going to go higher in the coming months and weeks. That will give some boost to this company. Secondly, IEX is also considering diversification. For example, they recently launched IGX, which is Indian Gas Exchange. So last year they made a profit of 28 crores. So again, it is at the very early stages of their life cycle. But when SN Goel was asked about the margin profiles of these new initiatives, what he said is, yes, you can expect a similar kind of EBITDA when it comes to IGX as well. And secondly, this company is also entering into trading of carbon credit. So what you see on my screen is there will be a voluntary carbon credit market as well in India, as well as mandatory carbon credit. So by the end of this financial year, they are planning to launch their voluntary carbon market here. And the timelines for mandatory carbon market is yet to be decided because there is a lot of regulation that is involved in this. So again, from a future diversification perspective, the company is working on Indian gas exchange, Indian carbon credit exchange, because they have the right knowledge and experience of running power related exchanges, which is something that the company has an upper hand on. But again, this is not a recommendation for you. You must do your own research and you must take your own positions based on your own analysis. So what is my take on this company? My take is extremely simple. This is highly regulated company and I do not want to invest in such highly regulated company because regulation can kill such companies in a jiffy. So I am out of this company, but please make sure you do your own research and you take your own positions based on your own analysis and do not rely on me. So far, if you're liking this video, hit the like button so that more and more people can understand the nuances of these businesses and stocks as well. With that, let me move to stock number three, which is Ratan India Enterprise Limited. Many of you actually dropped comments on my channel asking me to analyze Ratan India Enterprises Limited because as you can rightly see in the last one month, the stock has given 51% return. But if you look at the last one year, the stock has given close to 18% return. But in the last one month, the stock seems to be having some rally and you wanted me to analyze this and tell you what my position will be. So I'm not going to do a deep dive analysis here, but I will tell you the details that really matters right now about this company. So very quickly, let me tell you the brief history of this company. So what you see on my screen is the little history about this company back in 1999, India Bulls was started by three people, three IITNs, Samir Gehlot, Rajiv Ratan and Saurabh Mittal. And they eventually split out their business in 2014. And Rajiv Ratan at that time got two businesses. One was India Bulls Power at that time. And it was renamed to Ratan India Power. That's another listed company that the business has. And the second one is India Bulls Infrastructure at that time it was called. India Bull Infrastructure then was renamed to Ratan India Infrastructure. And two or three years ago, Ratan India Infrastructure was renamed to Ratan India Enterprises Limited. Let me quickly give you overview of their businesses. So if you look at their website, you will see that they are into retail. Coco Blue Retail Limited is their wholly owned subsidiary. I will talk about this company in few minutes you, and you will understand the details that nobody is talking about. Secondly, they are also into electric vehicle segment and they have this electric motorcycle which is Revolt Motors. They acquired it recently. And the third business that they have is that they've launched Neo Brands Limited, which is again a wholly owned subsidiary, which is into apparel and clothing and fashion business. Fourth business that they are into is VFIN, which is a consumer finance business, a fintech business, which is offering loans and things like that. Also, they are into Neo Sky, which is totally into drone sector. So they have this wholly owned subsidiary called Neo Sky Limited and which is leading the way apparently into the drone sector. And under this subsidiary, they also have another subsidiary called Throttle Aerospace System, where they are making drone hardware and software as well. Lastly, they also invested in a US based company called Metternet that is into drones again. So all in all, very, very diversified business. So what really matters is their latest results. So if I show you their latest results, you will see that in the last quarter, majority of their revenues were from retail sector. So retail e-commerce business had 1200 crores roughly from 1200 675 crores. So meaning that they are 95, more than 95% of their business is coming from retail e-commerce business. One point is is very very clear their businesses such as fintech business their drone business their ev business they have not started to significantly contribute in their revenues let alone about profit so is their retail business profitable before that let me quickly show you their business which is coco blue retail this is an e-commerce business and this is a listed retailer on the amazon platform they do not have an independent e-commerce platform they are very very tightly integrated with amazon as a supplier 
and all of a sudden this company has come into limelight that they are doing all of a sudden 1200 crores rupees of business what has happened here is, is that basically cloudtail used to be one of the amazon's owned subsidiary and used to be the number one seller on amazon when it comes to the apparel section amazon got rid of cloudtail because of some rule violations that they were doing this is another interesting case study that sometime i might shoot a separate video on how amazon was actually breaking the rules but coming back to the same topic here coco blue retail basically replaced cloudtail's business they got all the inventories and all of a sudden their business started to show some revenue growth but more importantly what i want to talk about is have a look at their quarterly results and one thing you will notice is that if i come down here and show you the total comprehensive income you will see that it is 1781 crores of profit they did last quarter but the main important point is that if you look at the revenues here so 2000 crore revenues were into other income this is extremely extremely important in the context of their profits because if we refer to note number four let us go down to note number four and what we will see is that this 2000 crore rupees of other income is nothing but it is the unrealized gains from the shares of ratan india power limited another company that this group has basically the company invested in the ratan india power limited shares and since the share prices would have gone up by whatever number and that has given them an unrealized gain of 2000 crores so if i were to remove this 2000 crore from this other income what is likely to happen is even their retail business is not profitable right now because if you look at their total profit for the year you will see 1781 crore rupees if i remove this 2000 crore rupees of revenues coming as additional income to the company they are going to be in negative not many people understand this so all in all their retail business right now is not profitable just because they've got this other income here their pnl looks profitable but they're not profitable and more importantly their all other businesses that they have launched they are in early stages of their picking up therefore not profitable right now so you must understand this point very very clearly the second key important point that i want to talk about this company is that their revenues from a retail perspective are extremely tied to the amazon as a business and amazon as a platform has a lot of cases against it you can see one of these on my screen and there is a lot of probe going on in Amazon as a business in terms of whether they are violating the rules or not from a FDI perspective. Again, that's a separate topic altogether, but I've given you the gist that the biggest risk that this company have from a retail perspective is that they are tied to the Amazon as a platform. And if tomorrow something were to happen to Amazon as a platform, then this company is going to be in trouble. Last point that I want to make about this company is, is about their shareholding pattern. So if you look at my screen, you will see that promoters maintains very high level of stake in the company which is extremely extremely good and positive however what i do not like about the company is that 11.30 percent of their promoters stakes are pledged and it has gone up from last quarter and it has gone up from 31st december 2022 meaning more and more shares are pledged and in principle i do not like the companies where the promoters had to pledge their stakes to get some more loans and borrowings from the market i do not like that in principle does this mean the company is bad absolutely not but right now i am not investing in this company i may invest in this company in the future and i will announce that on my youtube member community so consider subscribing to my youtube member community because that is where i talk about stocks mutual funds etc as well as my personal investment plan but right now i am not taking any position in this company that is not a recommendation for you please go ahead and do your own research and you might want to consider investing in this company based on your research. If you like my analysis, please press the like button so that more and more people can understand the nuances in these stocks. Also, let me know in the comments out of these three stocks and the information I've presented to you, which stock has the highest potential to continue giving solid returns in the coming years. With that, I will see you in my next video. Until then, keep rocking.